I, I, I'm not going to lie, I poked myself in the eye with some grass coming up. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Bobby Hayes and I have known each other for a long time, uh, since really the inception of Dakota Decoy. We hooked up and we kind of went separate ways for a while and we reconnected a couple years ago and Bobby's been trying to get me down here to Missouri to hunt with him. You're out here a ways. A little bit. I told you there's space for the ducks. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid and I duck hunted, we pretty much built everything we duck hunted with. So it got me into calls. I used to go over to this guy's house named Mike Keller. He owned Big Guy's Best. This is when I was in high school. And uh, first time I'd ever seen an acrylic duck call. Before that, you know, it was just a little like wooden folks and stuff. And he, he taught me how to run a duck call. Um, never really had any instructions, but I used to look at all the acrylic calls he'd have out in the, he had these little call racks in his basement. And uh, they were just really neat. So, so that's, that's kind of how I got into calls. So I started selling them in 04. So this next coming year will be my 20th year at doing this. But basically I make calls because I love duck hunt. That's, that's it. So one thing we've noticed this year because of the mild weather, we're in this huge, what I've heard is the biggest El Nino in like 25 or 30 years. This mild weather runs all the way up into Canada. So it's been a really weird migration year. Um, the birds are, there's still a ton of ducks and geese in North Dakota, Southern North Dakota, Northern South Dakota. The Missouri River all the way up through North Dakota is loaded up. We really haven't had a front or a push of ducks almost the whole season. So I've got a buddy, I've known him for, his name's Kyle White. Grew up down on the lake, absolute killer. And uh, since you guys were coming into town, Kyle has more ducks on his side of the state than um, state line than I have. So that's why we went over there. Hunting in uh, Kansas this year is pretty lean. You want these two, Bobby? Yeah, bro. Okay. Good boy. There you go, pork chopper. There you go. Just, I'd say I'd say get your boat where you want it, and then we'll just walk them out. Just um, whip them out, Bobby. I'll get to them. Who has more fun than us, right? Nobody. So the cool part about the new Lucky remote system. You used to have to push the button to get your remote program to it. Luke's gonna show us here. Now you do not. You have what, two, two or three programs in there, Luke? Three channels. Three channels. So A, B, and P. So if you have a normal, or the older model, this HD remote and receiver. Remember you used to hold the black button yep. on the remote and then hold the black button on the yep. module. Yep. Now if we just put it to A, we can have our spinners 
on A today, we'll put our remote on A and it will, it will automatically find it and we have our agitators on B. So there's no program other than flip the switch? Flip the switch, make sure your remote and the receiver match, ready to go. I wish I'd have known that all year. <laughs> Should have called and, me. And I do not read instructions. Luke is my instructions. Three channel I system. So with the new HD remote kit 2.0. That's really cool. You can still use your old stuff you had from years past. You just put it to the P mode and then you still would sync it like in years past. You still have to push the button on the old stuff. Right, but the old stuff and the new stuff all work together. Okay, that's awesome. Looks good, doesn't it? First one of the year. Feel that weight on that duck. They've been eating good. That's heavy, isn't it? That's a picker. There's a drake. Get him, boys. Shot. It's just like a big old walrus jumping off from the boat. Um, <laughs> I thought it was Kyle jumping off for a second, and I realized he just hanged. <laughs> <laughs> Right here, boys. Get him, get him, get him. Good shot, guys. That was Mr. Kyle Bauer. So one thing we noticed down here, the same as I noticed at home, the ducks that are here and in every area right now because of the, the weather are stale. You know, they've been around a long time and we could tell it right away. Uh, you had to be pretty light on the call. So experiment, if you've got call shy ducks, uh, decoy shy ducks, just watch your ducks. Uh, Bobby and I were talking, uh, when we both call, we aren't calling at the flock. You start out calling at the flock and you look up there. If you make a certain call sound, we watch the entire flock and if we see one duck react, it might be his neck turned, might be his wings all of a sudden lock up, that's your target. Call to that duck. Right in front. <laughs> I was joking with Kyle, you know, we first set up in the morning in the dark. We, we knew where the sun was coming up. You know, we joke, where's the sun gonna be? And someone will say the east. So we set up, we knew it was gonna be there, but his perfect hide was facing east. So we put the boat in that location, uh, waited for the sun to get a little tall, and then we started messing with boat position. I think we moved the boat maybe four times, trying different things, and we ended up right back under the original tree. The sun had gotten high enough and slid a little bit where we weren't staring right at it. But the hunt itself was mostly singles, pairs coming in. Uh, this time of year, when you get a single duck, most time it's a drake, and that's what was happening. We had drakes coming in, and the ducks that came in, they were feet down. They were right on us, right the whole boat out. <laughs> Good shot. God, how pretty was, do you see him gliding in here? Oh, oh that's what it's all about for yeah, me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right in the hole. Get him, Kyle. 
Nice Good shot. shot. Job, Kyle. Good, <laughs> Good shooting, guys. I could not not pull the trigger, <laughs> but it was like boom, my finger was already moving on. Ooh. I was all over and I might build through it. Well, we're about mid morning here on our first day in Missouri and it's been really good. I think we've got I think we've got eight drakes in the boat. It's been awesome. The ducks that are in here, they're in here. I mean they're they're wanting and this is a smart weed patch. Uh, it's cool. It's like hunting flooded timber. Um, the wind's been a little goofy. But uh, we've moved this boat, I think, four times trying to get it positioned correctly. But we went right back to the first spot we had it this morning. We're hid behind the trees. The ducks are coming, dropping right over the top of the trees. So another hunt Bobby had lined up was he's got, they hunt small ponds. Um, and they'd found a pond that's holding some canvas backs. Um, and going to be iffy whether they were there or not. And Kyle was gracious enough to ask us to stay and hunt a second day. Um, and, we decided to do that. You know, it was a beautiful setting. I, I love buckbrush and smart weed, and that's what we were in. Um, it was also, we were allowed because we were on a private acre, or some private acres, we were able to leave the decoys out. So we just left the decoys out, which made it really nice on that second morning. Oh yeah, you were there. Yeah, go. Yeah, go. Okay, go play. Go play. I think we're ready to rip. Come up. We'll move them up to get that brush where we sat yesterday. Okay. And we're, where are we going to put the boat over here? Put it over there. Okay. That way they come around this corner like they did yesterday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we're ready to go. I'm the guy who puts the food in the bowl. Yeah. Dries him off when he gets out of the water. <laughs> we got a dead calm morning so far. It's supposed to be they always give you a wind, right? So they're calling for five to six miles an hour, which in South Dakota means light and variable. It's going to go all over the place, so hardly any wind. I absolutely love the lucky agitators on days like this. When there's no wind, it actually creates motion out in there. in the decoy swimming around we're here talking about kyle bauer and duck calls and mike the camera guy goes you guys gonna shoot those what are we here for my bad man my bad <laughs> this blind's hard getting up on it well it was for a second <laughs> <laughs> My big chance. 
I, I, I'm not gonna lie, I poked myself in the eye with some grass coming up. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Shooting rubber bullets down there? Oh, you must be too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it was better for you on the flare. Really? First time I seen them was yesterday. We haven't had any. No pintails? No. Well, they're still up north. Yeah, none. We did pick up a few widgeon last week, which is odd. Those should be by before Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's a nice sprig. I think you guys doubled on it. One thing we noticed on day one hunt, uh, they had ice. And I, I'd asked Kyle, and he said they'd had one other little batch of ice, but we broke ice all the way out. We cleared the ice out with the mud motors, um, and it got cold. It was you know, close to 20 degrees, which for down here is really cold. And it appeared to be some new ducks coming in. And we had ducks in the air all day long. They didn't all work. Like I said, they were, they were acting stale, but we did shoot some ducks. I've got a, I've got a theory on that, because our day two hunt, um, Right away in the morning, we saw some ducks, and then honestly, we didn't see ducks the rest of the day. We ended up shooting a couple ducks. Um, my theory is ducks, they picked up some new birds, and they were in, they were active, they were moving around, trying to find out, learn the location. Um, we had a good hunt. The next morning, no birds. I think they're here. My theory is they blow into an area. The next day, they loaf, they rest. And I think tomorrow, which would have been our day three hunt, I think the boys are gonna have a great shoot. They've rested a day, they're gonna get back up. I always say ducks can't help themselves. They're sitting perfectly safe somewhere and they gotta get up and fly and possibly go get shot. So I think the guy's got a couple good days hunting coming here. No, that's that little lathe right over there. There it is, I recognize yeah, that. Yeah, that is a 20 year old jet lathe. If I polish calls, every polish call I've ever done has been on that lathe. Really? Yeah, yeah. So but how did you determine on your calls what diameter you wanted? Is that all your it's just, testing? It's just testing? all my math. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing you gotta think about, so if an insert is, if the insert on a duck call is 625, then the hole can't be 625. Right. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You made that mistake a few times, did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least oh, yeah. once. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so now you're going to just shape? Yep. Do you, I mean, you just have done so many of them, you yeah. know how you're. Yeah. Or does each fall a little different? No, well, they're different compared to the CNC. Yeah. But no, I just know what they are. Somewhat easier to work with than other, Bobby? Uh, actually, the harder it gets, the easier it is. Easier so it doesn't rip it up? Yep. Yeah, the harder it is, the better it machines. So you use a lot of walnut? Coca no. Coca Bola? Coca Bola is my favorite. Okay. Uh, that's just a wood chisel. Yep. And that's just a wood chisel. But I shouldn't say that one has. Uh, when I used to do this all the time yep. by hand, yep. all of them, I would go through like four or five of those a year. No kidding. Yeah. So but that yeah. would wear them down. Yeah, because you got to sharpen them. Oh constantly. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't like the big lathe tools. I've okay. never, I've never cared for them. Pretty You've much. told me before. Were you a woodworker? How did you start getting into turning stuff? Like um, this? 
I have always just made stuff. Okay. So, I'm 46, so I made ducks with a bilge pup on them when I was probably 18. Okay. Which I just made everything. Yeah. So I used to go up to Mike Keller's house when I was in high school, and uh, that's the first time I ever seen an acrylic duck hole. Okay. It wasn't, you know, a poly. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, like everything else, started messing with it. What's the name of this call you're making? It's an LT, okay. or a fuse. Okay. Depending on what insert goes in it. Okay. Show me this okay. system that you designed. So, all of the reeds are engraved. So they have the style, the cut of the reed, yep. and then the size. Okay. So this is a core reed kit. So you can say this is the base reed, okay. that all the other reeds work off of. So in a core reed kit, it has eight different lengths. Okay. And they go up between five and 10 thou per step. Okay. So when you tune one, there's no scissor cutting anything. You just go to the next step right. in length. Right. Which yeah. is where everyone struggles trying to tune their own core. Yeah. Yeah, because if you have a really, really sharp pair of scissors and you'll take a piece of mylar and trim it, if you measure that out, you're taking about 15 thousandths off. Yeah. So there's three steps in between that cut okay. of the smallest little sliver you can take off. Okay. Hmm. And so five thou on a duck reed in length is a lot. Okay. Yeah, so if a guy is going to tune one of these, all you do is take the reed out. So you just run it down the channel. With type up to start with, would you recommend? Or if the engraving top? is down... It'll have more hold and wine. Yeah. If the engraving is up so you can read it, then it has yeah, more, more rasp. rasp. That is just a preference. Okay. So if a guy likes to fall off on a note, yep. ah, ah, yeah. ah, then he'll like it down. Yep. If he wants to, ah, ah, he'll like it up. Okay. Yeah. But, and then inside of this, when you're going for how much pressure you want on it, up takes a little more pressure and down takes a little less pressure. Okay. So it's also more yep. on how much, how hard you want to yep. run. But yeah, so you put that in the notch, you put your wedge back in, and the only thing you have to do in this whole process is you have to make sure there's no gap right there. That's, yep. that's your only job. Yep, I always, I use the back of my knife because I'm always on the yep. boat. I just force that cork down in there. Yep, you just force it down because yep. if it's not, it'll be flat. Yep. And then anytime you change a reed, I tell everybody to take and just, you just want to pop the reed like that. You don't want to crank it. You just want to give it a good flex. How many times? A couple. Okay. So like if you've got an old duck haul yep. you haven't touched for a while, It'll sound flat because that, when that cork gets squished, that reed just drops down. Okay. It's not stood up. So if you and the mylar does the same oh, thing. How long should you change your cork? Oh, once a year. Okay. And with the stuff I use. Okay. But yeah, so anytime you just pop it a couple times, and it'll make the reed come to life. Okay. But so, if you're trying to figure out what reed fits you, you wanna so like you run number one, you're like ah that's pretty light. So go up a couple steps, you try three. Yep. And then you find where it is too stiff, okay. and then you'll be one or two down from there okay. on what's comfortable. Okay. Well, this also is an yep. accessory. Yeah, it comes in a little tent. Uh, with a call, you get a sample kit. Okay. So it has a number one read of each style. So okay. you get all five reads uh, of a number one. So gotcha. you can go through and try them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this was pretty cool. It's fun to see. Fun to see him from going from a garage, one little lathe, turning calls, to the equipment he has now. Um, he taught me some stuff. He's got a real cool read system for all his calls. He sent them to me. Of course, I messed with them and found out I messed them up a little bit. So I handed him a handful of calls and he helped me tune them. But he's, it's kind of a, I call it a fool safe system. And you'll see in the video, I mean, you can't mess it up. Uh, just don't be afraid to experiment with it. I think that was my biggest thing is I wasn't experimenting enough with it. But he taught me that. I saw all his new equipment. Very, very cool. So we get a little break for Christmas, um, and then we start a really hectic January. Uh, right after the first of the year, we're headed to our good friends, West and Billy Bonds at Goose Farms. I always joke with Cody, that's, that's more of my vacation. Very laid back hunting. Uh, we're done by nine every morning, and then we have nothing to do but sit around and be us. So looking forward to see the boys at Goose Farms. That's our next stop uh, right after Christmas.